Okay, thank you everybody. Is the mic okay? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sorry for the delay here. There's a bus of students that are coming, if you didn't hear that. Um, they'll be here any minute, and actually they're probably going to fill in over here, so if anybody wants to move over here, you're welcome to. We're going to end up using the hall room soon. Um, so um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here to introduce the topic of stochastic integer programming. Um, actually, if you look on the, the stoprog.org website, there's, an, a, there, there, the past tutorials from pre previous conferences, many of them are, are posted there. Um, and in fact, you know, there's, there's been several previous stochastic integer programming tutorials. Um, and so I think one thing that, that might be a little bit different um, in my tutorial compared to past ones is I'm going to be focused more on the integer programming side of it. So starting from that as my base and then adding stochastic to it. Um, and, and being a little more computational. So you won't see as much theory in this one as you might have might seen some of those, those other ones. And so if you want to see more theory, there, those resources are available there uh, on the stoprog.org website. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so what I'm actually going to do after just introducing, you know, telling you why stochastic integer programming is important, um, I'm going to actually start with an integer programming background. Um, because I'm, I'm not assuming here that everybody here has sort of taken a course in the methods of integer programming. Um, and so I want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page a little bit uh, on that. Um, and so after that, then I'm going to sort of talk about two different classes of methods for solving stochastic integer programs. Um, one that I'll call sort of cut-based methods that will be reminiscent of Bender's type algorithms. Uh, and the second class, uh, Lagrangian relaxation-based methods. Um, and then maybe if I have some time at the end, uh, uh, some odds and ends that might improve some of those. Um, and so basically, this is the outline of the whole thing. This isn't just the first half, so I don't get too scared. You know? So I have one set of slides for the whole thing at 5 o'clock. Somebody wave your hands and tell me it's time to stop and get coffee, uh, make sure we, we get our break. Uh, but we can be pretty informal. Um, and also, um, if you have questions along the way, please go ahead and interrupt me and stop me right then. Let's, let's you know, ask those questions right away and, and make sure we're all uh, following along. Okay, so a little bit of introduction. So here's going to be the, the notation that we're going to use in, in today's uh, tutorial. Um, and so I'm looking at a two-stage stochastic integer program. I have uh, my first stage variables are going to be denoted by x. Uh, and they have some, some linear costs in the first stage, and there's some linear constraints on those guys. Um, and then after I make those first stage decisions x, they become fixed. I observe some randomness, so it could be anything between, uh, you know, sort of the, the objective coefficients, the right hand side, or the constraint coefficients. May in general all be random, so that's all this random variable can see. After having observed all of that random data, then I'm allowed to make my recourse decision y. Okay, so this is up till now. This is standard two-state stochastic programming. The only sort of extra, you know, sort of thing that, that's new about this, this talk and to make it more difficult is that in general, both the first stage variables and the second stage variables might have some integer restrictions in them. Okay. So in various parts of this talk, I'm going to consider special cases where maybe the second stage is all continuous um, or, or, you know, or, or, or all integer. You know, so in some of these cases, these n1, p1, that's the number of continuous variables and integer variables. Some of those might be zero, so there'll be some special cases we might consider at certain points. But this is the most general version of a two-stage stochastic integer program. Um, okay, so there's tons of applications. Basically, you know, you know, making discrete decisions is very important, uh, and of course, we all understand the importance of uncertainty. So, so you can, you know, come up with lots of applications. I just want to give just a few examples to to, to get some motivation here. Uh, one of them that that I've um, that's interesting is stochastic service systems design. Um, and so here, the randomness is you might have sort of the the, the amount of demand that customers are going to have would be unknown in advance. Um, and yet you have to do, you know, design your, your system network. So you have to decide which, say, facilities to open and maybe what their capacity should be. You want to uh, decide that in advance. Um, and then the second stage decisions might be uh, which customers would be served by which of these servers and by how much. You know, so to sort of the operation of your network would be in the second stage after having observed uh, the demand. Um, and so in this case, the first stage variables might be binary, deciding like, whether or not to open a facility. And the second stage variables could either be binary if you sort of assume that they have to be served from a single uh, location, or they could be continuous if you're allowed to sort of ship from different uh, uh, service centers. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example is stochastic vehicle routing. And, and this is, I'm thinking in particular, of, of something that's known as a priori routing, where I want to choose a route in advance uh, of, and, and sort of follow that route. 
Um, and again, it maybe would have sort of along that route, the, the amount of customer demands that maybe you have to pick up to load into the truck is, is uncertain in advance. You don't know it in advance. Um, and so the first stage decision would be sort of what are the planned vehicle routes? You know, wh where, sh where do you hope these trucks will go and, and visit these, these customers and uh, collect their demand? Um, but the second stage decision would be, well, sometimes maybe you fill up the truck and you didn't get through the whole route, so what do you do then? So you have to have some kind of recourse action to, to respond to that. Um, and so in this case, it's typically uh, more of a binary decision of, of you have to actually, you know, sort of route again in the second stage. So that makes that, that a kind of a challenging two-stage problem. Um, and one more example is uh, stochastic, stochastic unit commitment. Um, so this is a, an application in, in energy. Um, and so here, the, the uncertainty can come from maybe electricity demands or more significantly probably from the amount of renewable energy that's being injected into your network that you have to sort of absorb as, as it comes. Um, and so in, this, in the stochastic unit commitment problem, there's integer decisions of deciding which uh, generators, or they're called units in, in, in the, the electricity literature, or which of these generators to be on or off at various points in time in, in your planning horizon. So there'll be many binary decisions. Um, and then the second state decisions might be continuous, just saying, you know, what are the operational levels of the generators given uh, the demands that, that you've observed and, and the wind productions that you've observed. But there might also be some binary decisions also in the second stage. Maybe you have an option to uh, switch some, some power lines on and off in the second stage in response to that. Um, and so that, there's an example where we have also binary variables in the second stage. Um, and so basically, I just wanted to give some examples that show yes, these are interesting uh, important uh, application areas, and they ha might have binary and continuous variables uh, in both the first or the second stage. Okay, so some examples. Okay, so before we go any further, I'm going to first of all put in my. Uh, I'm, I'm an optimization researcher at Wisconsin, so I'm obliged to put a Simpsons picture in every, any talk that I give, um, and so this is my obligatory Simpsons picture. Um, and so if you were here to hear about chance-constrained integer programming or multi-stage integer programming or risk-averse integer programming, sorry, you know, they, I'm just going to focus on two-stage stochastic integer programming. It's enough, okay? So we're really going to focus on that. Many of the, you know, of course, the methodology that's, that's used for two-stage, of course, is also useful for the multi-stage or these other cases as well. So I'm going to stay focused just on the two-stage uh, uh, model. The other thing I'm going to do right away and once and for all is I'm going to go to a finite scenario model. Okay, so I'm going to assume that our uncertainty is represented by a finite set of scenarios. Okay, so all of our uh, random sort of uh, coefficients, right-hand sides, so the constraint matrices. I just have a list, capital S, of these scenarios that, that I, I have uh, from the start. Um, each scenario S has a probability PS that it would show up. And I'm going to have to assume that this, the size of this is not too large, okay? So maybe it's a couple hundred or maybe even a couple thousand, so it can be, you know, reasonably large, um, but it's not going to be, you know, a million, 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 okay? So it has to be something that I can work with, this, uh, the size of this scenario set. Okay. okay, and so where does that come from? Um, I'm not going to get into too much of the theory of this, but I just want to tell you that the theory exists of sample average approximation, okay? So the idea of sample average approximation is that you take, if you have a more general sort of model that's not a, a reasonably small number of scenarios, uh, you take a random sample of that, maybe of, of a certain size that, that you, you would like to try to work with, um, and then you solve a problem where you replace the uncertainty in your model with this, the empirical distribution from that random sample. Okay, so you solve this so-called sample average approximation problem. Um, and what's nice about this is, is the required sample size, which is, you know, sort of, if you haven't seen this theory before, it's actually pretty remarkable, only grows linearly with the dimension of the first stage decision variables, okay? And, you know, it, it of course grows with sort of the, the some properties of the, the, the uh, random variables and things, but, but the, the big thing is it's linearly in the dimension of the first stage decision variables. So it's, you know, it might get to be reasonably large if you have a large problem, but it's not intractably large, okay? So, um, that's, that's the good news of this. Um, the first thing, the other thing I want to make sure to clarify is, is that this is, I would say, medium accuracy, okay? Because it's going to grow not so gracefully with the, the accuracy of the solution you want. So if you wanted, you know, to make sure you were within, you know, 0.01% of the true optimal solution, that's going to be hard to do. The sample size might get, get to be too large. But if you're happy with 1%, uh, to the true optimal, then, then maybe uh, sample average approximation gets you close enough. 
So that's going to be my justification for, for the rest of this talk, assuming I have just a, a list of scenarios. Okay, so I'm going to work with, with that from now on. Um, and so, so you know, what's nice about this is then you, know, you can actually get some statistical estimates of optimality, so you don't just have to rely on sort of the a priori suggestions of how big your sample size should be. You can solve the problem, repeat this experiment many times, and you get some, some after-the-fact estimates of, of uh, solution quality. Um, and so, so the key challenge, though, after, if you're using a methodology like this, is to solve these SAA problems. Okay? So what you have is you, know, you need the, the sample size to be large enough so that you start to get accurate enough solutions. Um, and then you get something that's still a large scale uh, integer program. Okay, so we're going to focus on how do we solve those problems. Okay, so any questions about that before we move on? That's, really, I mean, that, that's all I'm going to say about sample average approximation. Uh, so if anybody was wanting details more about that, I'm sure there's experts in the audience who would answer the question for me if you had a really deep question as well. So then I'm going to uh, give an example, okay? And this is going to be kind of a, a running example I'm going to use throughout the, the tutorial today. So, so we wanna, I'm going to take some time to explain it. Um, and it's, it's quite related to the first example application uh, that I told you about. I'm going to give you the, the, the model now. Um, so the setup here is we have a firm that's deciding which facilities to open. Those are going to be our first stage decisions. Um, and we, they're going to serve customers when the, cu the customers have random demand. Um, and our goal is going to be then to minimize the total expected cost, where we're going to have cost in the first stage for opening facilities, so those will be fixed costs. And then in the second stage, we're going to have some cost for serving the customers from the various facilities. Um, and also, we'll have the option that if we weren't able to serve all the customers, then, then there's sort of a penalty for not having served everybody. Okay, so we have some, some penalty there. Um, so some notation here. Um, the set of possible facilities to open, I'm going to denote by the set capital I. J is going to be the set of customers. This FI is going to be the fixed cost for opening uh, facility I. Uh, capital C I is the capacity of facility I. So I'm going to assume that's fixed. If I open it, if that's the capacity. You could have an extension of this model where that was also a decision variable, um, but I'll just uh, take that as fixed. Um, and then um, looking at what will be cost in the second stage, um, if I open facility I and I serve a unit of customer J's demand through that facility, it gives me a, a cost of CIJ. Okay, so that's the cost per unit. Um, QJ is going to be the penalty if I don't meet a unit of customer J's demand. Uh, and then PS is, again, the probability of seeing scenario S. Um, and then these are my, my sort of uh, random variables. DJS is the, random d the demand that I see in scenario S for customer J. Okay, so we have these first stage binary variables. Xi is going to be a 1 if we open facility I and a 0 otherwise. So we have these first stage binary variables. Uh, and then the, this sort of the model looks like this. We're minimizing the fixed cost. So we sum up over all the, the, the facilities we open and multiply them with whether or not we open those facilities. Um, and then this is the expected costs. Um, and I guess uh, there should be a PS here for the probability of scenario S showing up there, where QS of X is going to be the cost of sort of operating the system. If I have the, the, the facilities defined by x opened. Okay. And so that we can formulate. This is going to be an example where it's continuous recourse. So all of my second stage variables are just continuous variables. So this is just a linear program when the x is fixed. Uh, and so I have uh, these are my costs. These are the costs of actually serving demand. This is the penalties for unmet demand. This is making sure that for each customer, I either serve the demand or else I have to record that. that What's not served is unmet. Um, and then this is the capacity constraint. And this constraint here does two things. Okay? So I want to highlight this one. It's important. One, it's the capacity. For, so for facility I, the total amount that I send of, uh, of, of customer demand that I serve can't be more than that facility's capacity, which is CI. But I'm also multiplying that with this variable XI, because this is also going to say if XI is 0, so I didn't open the facility, then I can't use it at all, right? So if xi is 0, then this forces all of those yij's to be 0, so I'm not using that facility at all. But if xi is 1, then that's my, my total uh, capacity for that facility. Okay. Okay, so, and then these variables are all continuous. Okay, so that's our first example. So the perspective I take with, with stochastic integer programming, once I've done this sort of this sampling step, I have you know, a large number of scenarios, 
is that really it's just a very large scale structured mixed integer program. Um, and in fact, you know, that's a, this is the first option always for solving a stochastic mixed integer program, if you have finitely many scenarios, is to form the extensive form. Okay. And this is just the same as, as the extensive form of, of two-stage stochastic programming. The only difference is I have to put in the integer decision uh, constraints as well. Okay, so this is uh, your standard extensive form. So what we've done is for every second stage, for every scenario, I've made a copy of the second stage decision vector y. So now that's denoted as ys. Um, and I'm sort of summing up over all of their uh, costs. Um, I have my first stage constraints. And again, for every second stage, uh, this should be for all s. I have a set of constraints linking those guys together. Okay, so this x is common. There's only one uh, set of x variables. So that's what links these all, all together. Okay, so you could set up and solve this really large mixed integer program. That's option one. Uh, and this is what it looks like for the stochastic facility location problem. Um, so again, I've just, uh, for all these, these second stage variables, the, the flow variables from serving customer J's demand from facility I, got an extra index S for saying that's what I'm going to do if I'm in scenario S. And likewise for the unmet demands of uh, customer J in scenario S. Okay? And so these, all these constraints just got an extra copy of them. And so it's really a large scale problem because if, I, if you imagine I have you know, like something like 10 or 20 uh, possible facilities and 50 or so possible customers, we're on the order of 1,000 or so decision variables already. And then I multiply that by the number of scenarios that I have. Maybe, maybe I need 1,000 if I have a pretty large problem. And it's a really big problem. Okay? Lots of constraints, uh, lots of uh, especially second stage variables. OK, so in general, what makes stochastic mixed integer programming hard? Um, and really, you know, it's combining challenges from, from, from two fields that, that are, are themselves challenging, right? So we have stochastic programming and integer programming being merged together here. In terms of integer programming, you know, one of the challenges here is we're going to have a large number of discrete variables, potentially. Uh, we have to deal with that. Um, and one of the challenges that you face in integer programming is getting good relaxations. And I'm going to get into that in more detail. But if you don't have a good relaxation, then it's going to be very, very hard to solve your problem. Okay, so we're going to see the same challenge uh, in stochastic integer programming. Um, and of course, in, in, in stochastic programming, we have the challenge of evaluating expectation, uh, which, okay, maybe we'll, we'll approximate with that with sample average approximation, but then it's still a very large scale problem. Um, and so you still have that uh, huge size even in that case. So the key questions is, you know, how can we approximate the expected value? I already said we're going to use sample average approximation for that. Um, how do we obtain strong relaxations? That's kind of a question that we study a lot in integer programming. Um, and I'm going to sort of discuss how we might do that in stochastic integer programming. Um, how do we de decompose this really large problem into smaller problems that are easier to work with, that you, maybe you can load it into the memory on your laptop or something like that? Um, and then there's sort of combining these two things together becomes quite tricky. So I can maybe decompose, or I can get strong relaxations, but to do that together is, is an extra challenge. Okay, so how can I both decompose and get strong relaxations together? We'll talk about uh, that. Um, and also just, you know, how do you define, in some cases it becomes very tricky to just to get an algorithm that converges in the end to the best possible solution. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. OK, so that's just the introduction. Now I'm going to move on to a background of integer programming. If you are an expert, if you've taken courses in integer programming, I apologize. This whole next section is going to be very introductory and basic for you. But just take it as an opportunity for uh, reviewing notation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start out with uh, branch and bound. Um, and so this is really the basic idea behind any algorithm for solving integer programs. Um, is, is branch and bound. And so the way it works is th the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we have this problem that's too hard to solve by itself. So what we do is we construct a, a different problem, which we call a relaxation. Um, so this relaxation, generally you ignore some constraints or you replace them with some less, less restricting constraints. Um, and it typically is much easier to solve. Okay, so the idea is you have this other problem, this relaxation that you can solve efficiently. And the idea of this is that if I'm, I'm I'm minimizing, and when I solve this relaxation, I get sort of an optimistic value. I get a lower bound on the best possible solution I can get. Okay, so it gives me some information about what the optimum value might be. Um, if I get really lucky, 
if I've solved the relaxation problem and, and it happens to be feasible to all those constraints that are relaxed, well, then it's also an upper bound, and I know it was a lower bound to start with, so I would know that it's an optimal solution. Otherwise, which is the usual case, I'm not so lucky, then I have to do some dividing of the feasible region, uh, which would, is what we call branching, and repeat this process. Okay? So that's, that's the, the basic idea. So in integer programming, the sort of core relaxation that's used is, is the linear program relaxation. It's a very simple one. Uh, if I have this mixed integer program, so just a deterministic mixed integer program, I just have these variables x. Um, some of them have integer constraints. The linear programming relaxation is where I just replace those integer constraints with just all the variables being non-negative. So I make all the variables continuous. Okay? So that's the, the standard linear program relaxation. And it's easy to see that if I minimize an objective over just these constraints, instead of requiring them to be integer, I have more possible solutions, right? Um, and so, of course, the, the minimum value will be smaller or equal to the minimum I could have gotten when I enforced those other constraints. Okay? So I get a lower bound by solving this, this linear program relaxation. So what about branching? So in, in, in general, the, the idea with, with branching is that we were given some optimization problem uh, and I'm going to write this very generically, okay? So this isn't really even restricted to, to mixed integer linear programming. This actually we can see will apply to stochastic integer programming equally well. Um, so this set S is just kind of some generic feasible region. Um, and so this is the, the, you know, but it's hard to handle explicitly. So I'm minimizing a linear objective over that set S. And the idea with branching is that if I could break this set S into smaller sets, okay? So I somehow subdivide my feasible region. Um, and the key requirement is that the union of the feasible region of all these smaller sets should be equal to what I started with. Okay? Um, often you would like these smaller sets to be disjoint of each other, but that's not actually necessary. Okay? This, this it still works as long as the union is equal to S. Okay? Um, and so, what, I mean, it's a simple observation is that, so if, if I can write S as the union of these different sort of feasible region sets, then one way that I could solve my problem minimizing over the set S is instead I could solve the problem over each individual subset, these sets SI, so each of those, and take the best out of all of those, right? So that's what I'm taking the min over the, each of these subsets. Okay? So that's a very simple observation. I could take my full region, break it into smaller subsets, and take the best of all of those, and that solves my original problem. Okay? But that's the idea of branching. So, so the idea is we optimize over each subset separately, um, and we create these, these smaller subproblems, and, and we call that branching. And the idea is that these, these subsets hopefully are somehow easier to handle. Okay? And why might they be easier to handle? It's because we're also going to have this other step that's bounding. Okay? So I can think of like sort of branch and bound as a divide and conquer algorithm. That's sort of one way to think about it. Um, and so dividing is branching. And the bounding step is how you conquer this, okay? So, you, so it's only going to work if you can do this bounding step really well. Um, so if, first of all, for, in terms of uh, an upper bound, so uh, again, we're minimizing. So if I get any feasible solution, then that's one possible solution. And so that will, if I plug that into the objective value, it's an upper bound. Okay? So maybe I can run a heuristic or something. I can find a feasible solution to get an upper bound on my, my problem. And after branching, now I have all these different subproblems, which I've denoted by these, these S sub i, these smaller feasible regions. And I solve a relaxation now over that subproblem, and I get a lower bound of the best possible solution in that subproblem constraint set. So I get such a lower bound. And if I, if I want to have an overall lower bound on what's the, 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 the best I could possibly do, again, I have to consider all possible subproblems. I need to take the smallest of those. That's sort of the, the best case scenario for me. But the key thing is, this is what makes branch and bound work when it works. It doesn't always work. But if it's going to work, it's going to be because of this, is that if I compute this lower bound from one of my subsets, L of SI, and I find that it's bigger or equal to an upper bound that I found by some other mechanism, then I know I can throw away that, that subproblem. Right? I know that there's not going to be any solution to that subproblem that will be better than what I already know, this capital U. And so that's what makes branch and bound work. And so, again, in integer programming, in deterministic 
mixed integer programming, we're usually solving the LP relaxation. But this branch and bound concept works with other relaxations as well, and we're going to see that in, in, in stochastic mixed integer programming uh, today. Uh, okay, so just to kind of recap and you know put this branch and bound, these ideas into an actual algorithm, make it a little more formal. Um, so the first thing we do um, is so ZIP is going to denote the optimal value of the integer program. That's the thing we want to find. I'm first going to solve the original relaxation of the problem get with of the whole problem. Um, if it's unbounded, then of course the real problem is unbounded. Okay, this is a, a property of, of integer programming um, that it would have to be actually unbounded or infeasible. Um, it, but if it's infeasible, then of course you know that was relaxation, so it must be infeasible. Um, if we're really lucky, we get a feasible solution to the integer program, then we know it's optimal. That's uh, what we mentioned before. But the last case is the one that we're typically in. Uh, we just have a lower bound. Okay, so this L would be the lower bound. Um, and so in that last case, then we have to start the, the branch and bound process until we uh, uh, do this. And so we, we branch and we recursively solve the resulting subproblems by the same method. Um, and so setting up some terminology, when we start doing this branching process, um, we're going to form a search tree. And the subproblems that are created in the search tree we'll sometimes call as nodes in that search tree. Um, when we eliminate a problem from further consideration, because we can sort of rule out that there will be a possible optimal solution there, uh, we call that pruning, because that sort of that part of the tree is cut off. We don't have to consider it anymore. Um, when we consider a subproblem, then we, you know, we're going to solve the relaxation for that subproblem. Then we're going to consider doing branching. That whole process is called processing the, the node or the subproblem. Um, and then we're building up this tree, and we can only process one subproblem at a time, or a certain number if you're doing it in parallel at a time. Um, and so the ones that haven't yet been processed are called candidates. Okay, so we'll be putting a bunch of candidates out there as this tree grows. And the set of all the candidates, the things that we still have to, to look at, is the candidate list. And so the, the way the algorithm works, so we, again, we maybe hopefully start out with some, some heuristic, and we get an upper bound. Then we put the original problem with no branching constraints enforced, just the original constraint set on this candidate list. So that gets us started out here. Um, and then at any step in the, in the algorithm, we're going to choose something from the candidate list. Uh, so let's call that uh, problem S. We solve the relaxation for that particular subproblem. Um, if the relaxation is infeasible, then we know we can prune that node, because there couldn't possibly be any solution to the real subproblem if the relaxation didn't have any solution. Um, if the lower bound is uh, less than th uh, the best known upper bound, the value you get from the relaxation is less than that, and the solution is actually feasible to your original problem, then you have a new solution that's better than what you had before. So in that case, you'll update the upper bound. So this upper bound gets updated to that value of that relaxation solution. Um, if, on the other hand, this lower bound is greater or equal to a known upper bound that you have, that's that case we talked about when you can prune that node. You don't have to consider it any further. So no more candidates created in that case. And in the last case, this is where sort of you kind of lose the game, is you have to create more candidates. Okay? You have to keep diving further. You have to keep, keep creating more subproblems. So we branch. Uh, we're going to then create two new subproblems by further subdividing this set S into smaller sets and continue this process. Okay? So that's sort of a generic branch and bound algorithm. Um, and eventually, hopefully, that candidate list uh, becomes uh, uh, empty and you'd be done. Okay. Otherwise, you have to go keep going back to step three and choosing a new candidate. Okay. So I like to, this is a very simplistic approximation, but, you know, to think about, you know, if I, if I have a branch about an algorithm and I'm going to make lots of choices about, you know, how I, I, I solve relaxations in this and things like that, it's useful to think about how these choices will affect the solution time in the end. Okay. So a very useful way to think about you know, how long it's, is this branch and bound algorithm going to take is to think about the, this approximation is that the total time for the algorithm is the time to process one node multiplied with the number of nodes that you end up processing. Okay. Now this is, of course, a, a very sort of crude approximation because not all the nodes are equal, especially the root node is much more expensive than other nodes. But but it's, it's a useful approximation because it, it helps you understand the trade-offs of, of, of decisions that you're going to make in, in your algorithm. Um, so for example, for very large-scale instances, like, like in stochastic 
programming, that time to process a single node, so solving the one relaxation, can be really, really expensive, right? So you're gonna have to do clever things in order to even get one node's time down to something that you can, that, that's small enough that you can work with. Right? On the other hand, if you don't get good enough relaxations from bounds from the relaxation that you solve so that you're able to do this, this pruning in the branch and bound tree a lot, the number of nodes can potentially grow exponentially in the number of decision variables of your problem. And if that happens, then of course you're, you're, you have no, no chance to solve even a medium-sized problem. So you really have to make sure that that, that uh, factor is kept under, under control. So the key to success of a branch and bound algorithm is you have to solve the relaxations fast enough not necessarily very fast, there's a trade-off always, right, between how hard it might be to solve relaxation versus maybe the number of nodes, so, but you have to be able to solve it fast enough. Um, and then on the other hand, you really need strong relaxations so that you don't have to branch too much. So when I say prune high in the tree, that means, you know, the, the alternative is I branch, 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 and I went way, way, way down, and my tree just blew up, and then you have no hope of solving this problem, okay? So you need these strong relaxations so that you prune early, and that doesn't happen. Okay, so just a couple other things that, that, are, that are important, but, but sort of less so than the, these two. Uh, making good branching decisions, so that actually has a, a big impact on the size of the tree. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but, but it is important just to put it out there. Um, and also you wanna have good heuristics so that you can get good upper bounds quickly, okay, so that you can do the proning as well. But typically, if, you, you know, if you're looking at an application, for example, it's often easier to get a good heuristic, um, so that's not the part I'm gonna, gonna, gonna focus on. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we actually, in integer programming, how we go about getting the stronger relaxation, some of the, the methodology there. And so the key, one of the key methodologies is, is valid inequalities or just more generally improved formulations. Um, okay, so let's go back to our facility location example. Um, to, to illustrate this notion that integer programming, you could often formulate a set of feasible solutions in many different ways. Okay, so the same set of feasible solutions can be described in different ways. Okay. Um, so in this facility location for example, problem, for example, we had this, this xi was you know, what binary variable whether or not facility i is open, yij was how much of customer j's demand is served from facility i, those were continuous variables. And we had this constraint, which said when xi was zero, that forced every, all these guys to be zero, but at, when xi was one, then we had sort of our capacity constraint. So that's one way to, to model this. Um, but we could also put in some redundant constraints. Okay, so I wanna convince you that if I put these inequalities into my model, I wouldn't cut off any feasible solutions. Okay? Because if xi is zero, then by this constraint, which is already in my model, all these yij's have to be zero anyway. So it's no problem to say that yij less than or equal to zero. They had to be zero anyway. Okay? On the other hand, if xi is one, then, okay, the, the, some of the y's is at most ci, so, but each individual yij is, is of course not more than ci, so it's less than or equal to the ci, excuse me. But also, what's the maximum amount that I'm gonna send from facility i to customer j is never gonna be more than the demand of customer j, okay? So certainly this is, this is okay to add this, this constraint. Okay. So if you look at this, if you're not sort of familiar with the way integer programming algorithms work, you would think it's crazy to think about adding these constraints in my formulation. Right here I have this very nice compact, and it's one constraint for each facility. Um, so imagine I have you know, 100 facilities and 100 customers. This is only 100 constraints. Whereas here I have a constraint for every customer and every facility pair. So that'd be like 10,000 constraints, right? Seems really silly to think about adding all these extra constraints which do nothing to your model. And in fact, they don't do anything for the integer feasible points. That's what I argued there. When xi was zero, one, the set of solutions that satisfied those constraints is exactly the same. But there are many fractional points that will satisfy this constraint, but will not satisfy these constraints. And in integer programming, we're gonna be solving the LP relaxation as part of the way to get the bounds in this branch and bound tree. And so I care about whether or not the fractional points satisfy these. So these inequalities here actually might be a good idea to add to my formulation so that I can eventually solve this integer program. And we'll see it in an example of this later. 
Okay. So in general, we have these two different formulations, say, in integer programming. So in, in, you know, in this example, we had fewer constraints. And there is an advantage to that. You will solve that LP relaxation faster. Okay? It's a more compact model. Okay? So there is an advantage there. On the other hand, I could add all these extra constraints um, and hope I get a better relaxation. Okay? So that's a trade-off. Okay? And, and it's not always obvious ahead of time which would win, which is more important. Okay? Um, but I would say that, in general, your better bet is with the formulation that gives you a better bound, even if it's bigger. So you start out with that formulation that's bigger. If it gives you a better bound, then what you just do is you figure out some way to solve that bigger formulation. Okay? So maybe you have to do some specialized algorithms to, to handle that, that bigger formulation. But it, it will pay off. Okay? Those bounds are really important. Okay. So just to show you what this would look like in that stochastic facility location example, um, so these were my original constraints. This is deterministic equivalent. And I just added these extra constraints. Um, and so actually, there's another typo. It should be i and i and j and j and s and s. So it's a huge number of extra constraints. Um, but I'm hoping that they will improve the linear program relaxation. That's the goal. OK, so that idea, what, what I just did there for the facility location problem, is, is an example of, of an integer programming. Sort of the, the main field of study is the study of valid and inequalities. Okay. So I'll just introduce that concept. Um, and so a valid inequality, in general, I have a, a, a mixed integer set, so I have con these variables x and rn, but some of them, some subset of them are required to be integer as well. Um, and I have my linear constraints. And an inequality, uh, I'll say pi x less than or equal to pi 0, is going to be called a valid inequality for the set capital X if that inequality is satisfied by every point in the set capital X. Okay, seems like a, a sort of a simple thing. Um, and so, so that's the definition of a valid inequality. And so the key thing is here is it's satisfied by every point in the set capital X, which includes the integer constraints. Okay? But it's not necessarily means that it's satisfied by the, the, the points that are in the LP relaxation of that set. Okay? That's the, the idea of this. Um, and so we sometimes call valid inequalities, you might have heard about cuts in an integer program or cutting planes. Um, they're kind of used interchangeably a little bit. Um, usually when we say cutting planes, it's sort of when it's used as part of an algorithm to cut off some relaxation solution. Okay? But they're uh, interchangeable. Um, and so the goal of adding these valid inequalities to the formulation is that when I solve the LP relaxation, I hope that I will get a better bound. Okay, so that's why we, why we do valid inequalities. Um, and ultimately, hope, we hope that better bound translates to exploring a smaller number of branch and bound nodes. OK, so if I want to use valid inequalities, if, you've, if you believe me that it's important to solving an integer program, then I need to understand how can I find valid inequalities, which is a Highly non-trivial task. It's the, the subject of much, much research in integer programming. Um, and also, I need to understand, well, what, how will I use them okay, computationally within a branch and bound algorithm? Okay, so I want to say a little bit about, about these. Um, so the first question about in terms of, or the, the second one I'll answer first, in terms of using valid inequalities, there's sort of two general approaches, or kind of three, I guess. Um, one thing, which is the example we did in this facility location uh, problem, is just Add them to the formulation. I started out with some formulation. I found there are these redundant constraints I could add, but they're not redundant for the LP relaxation. So I get a bigger formulation. Okay? Um, and so and that formulation will have a better LP relaxation. It's good. It's nice. It's easy to implement. But the downside about that is it's only feasible when the set of valid inequalities that you have are sort of, you can write them down ahead of time and they're not too large. Okay? So that's only, you know. And in many of the valid inequalities that we're going to talk about, you can't do that. You find them algorithmically after the fact, or, or they're just an exponential number of them. Um, and so, so you can't do this approach. But when you can do this way, it's, 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 it's a good way. Um, so, but if you're in this other case where, where you need some sort of an algorithm to find valid inequalities, um, then what you do is you try to add them as needed to cut off fractional solutions. So the idea is you'll solve the LP relaxation as it is. Then you get a, an LP relaxation solution, and you go off and do some work to find a valid inequality or try to find a valid inequality that would separate that point, cut that point off. I'll re-add that to, or add it to my LP relaxation and solve it again, and I repeat that process. Okay, so we have this kind of cutting plane algorithm loop. Uh, and there's actually two different ways we can imagine doing that method. Okay, so one of them in integer programming, we call it, call it cut and branch. So the idea here is we do this process 
only with the initial LP relaxation. So I sort of solve the LP relaxation, I add cuts, I solve, I add cuts. And then after I've done that and I have this kind of improved formulation, then I might just give it to my integer programming solver and not pay attention to it anymore. So that's the end of my, my adding cuts to it. Okay. We call that cut and branch. Um, in contrast, the alternative would be something that we call branch and cut, where we do this process of solving the LP relaxation, adding cuts to, to the LP relaxation, and then resolving, um, at, at possibly also at nodes in the branch and bound tree. Okay, so we do this um, you know, throughout the tree. And so at a node in the branch and bound tree, now we have sort of this loop within the node where we're solving an LP, add cuts, solve LP, add cuts, until we, we decide to stop. So we call that branch and cut. Um, and so we, when, when you start introducing cuts into the mix of a branch and bound algorithm, there's a trade-off. Okay? So, so, and typically you have some control over this. You can decide you, there's all kinds of really expensive algorithms for generating more and more and fancier cuts. Um, and so, you know, as you add more cuts, you expect that you'll get better bounds and hence fewer nodes in your branch and bound tree. But you pay a price for that because you're spending a lot of time finding those cuts. And then when you add those cuts to the linear program relaxation, you're spending a lot of time resolving the linear program relaxation, and it's getting bigger with all those cuts. So there's a trade-off there, okay? And, and you know, sort of, you have to find the right balance there. Right? So that's just something to be aware of. Okay. So, in, so how does this branching cut work uh, more specifically? So again, at a node in the branch and bound tree, we solve the current LP relaxation, get some solution x hat. Then we go off and we try to generate valid inequalities that will separate that, that, that solution x hat. If we succeed, we add those to the linear program relaxation and solve it again. And sort of this is a, a, a loop until we, we uh, decide to stop. And so why would we do branch and, uh, branch and cut approach? Okay, so there's two reasons. Um, one is just so maybe we hope to improve the relaxation bounds and we then get a smaller number of uh, branch and bound nodes. Okay, so that's, that's a reason that people in integer programming have done branch and cut for, for many years. In this talk, though, the second reason is going to be more important for us. Okay. Um, and so the second reason is that sometimes we have a formulation that has so many constraints to define the formulation that you can't write them all down. And so instead of what you do is you add those inequalities that actually define the feasible region as part of the branch and bound tree. Okay. And in that case, you must do branch and cut, because if you didn't, you might get to a point in the branch and bound tree where you thought your solution was feasible, but you actually didn't have every constraint of your model in the formulation, and so your solution actually violates some constraint. Okay, so in, branch and cut is a mechanism for being able to sort of go back and check some constraints that you left out. So that's uh, the, the second approach. And so this branch and cut approach is at the heart of all modern mixed integer programming solvers. So that's uh, using cutting planes as part of this is, is key. If you use a, a MIP solver, they always give you an option to add cuts of your own at nodes in the branch and boundary. So you can kind of work with the, the integer programming solver uh, to do this yourself. Okay. So let's go back to the other question of how do we derive valid inequalities? Okay, and this is, you know, this could be a whole tutorial or, you know, a whole course uh, on integer programming. So I'm only going to give you just a bit of a flavor for the types of things that are done for driving valid inequalities. Um, and so, first of all, just in terms of you know, the, the general approach, one thing you can do is try to find general purpose valid inequalities. Okay? So all you're doing in this case is you're looking at a mixed integer set. You just assume you have linear constraints, you have some binary variables, um, and, and you don't otherwise look at the structure of this problem. And you have some methodology for generating cuts that works um, for all of these. And this is really critical. Uh, to, the, to the success of commercial integer programming solvers, which, which uh, use all kinds of these general purpose types of cuts. But the other thing you can do, if you know something about your problem, like we knew something about that facility location problem, we can derive valid inequalities or redundant constraints um, that rely on the structure of the problem. Okay? So we can come up with some on our own. Um, and so this is very often the case in combinatorial optimization problems. So there's all kinds of known valid inequalities for the matching problem, traveling salesman problem, set packing, and so on. So, so there's all kinds of classes of valid inequalities for specific structures. Uh, knapsack constraint is another one where there's special classes of valid inequalities derived for that. Uh, flow balance and, and so on. Okay? So if you have structure in your problem, then there's certain classes of valid inequalities that you can either develop or use uh, based on that, that structure. So in terms of the, the generic uh, possibilities, I'm going to talk about one of those. It's known as split cuts. Okay? It's, it's, it's sort of geometric and ni nice to see. Um, so let's uh, set up some notation again. So imagine I have 
uh, capital X is my mixed integer set, so P is a, is a polyhedron. So in this picture, imagine P being the, the set that's sort of in this diamond here, everything in this diamond. Um, so that's a polyhedron. And I'm interested, say, in the integer points in that set, so that's the set capital X. Um, and so those would be the, the black dots here. Okay. So you see, if I solve the LP relaxation, I can get all of this stuff out in this diamond, but I'm really only interested in those, those black dots. Okay. So I wanted, I'd like to get cuts maybe that, that get me closer to those black dots. Um, and so what we can do is, is in, in general, we've defined a, uh, an integer vector pi that's going to be zero in the coefficients of continuous variables. Okay, so this integer vector is only allowed to be non-zero on variables that, that are integer variables. Um, and I also get another integer value, pi zero. And so because this pi is only non-zero at integer uh, variables, if I take the, the inner product of pi with x, then I'm, for any feasible solution to my problem, x, those coefficients of x that, that show up in this <laughs> inner product, uh, must be integer variables. And the pi coefficients are integer, so that thing is an integer. It must be an integer in any feasible solution. Okay. So it must be integer for any feasible solution. Um, and so, because that must be an integer, then if x is, is a feasible solution, I can say this kind of disjunctive principle, an either or condition, either pi x is less than or equal to pi zero, or pi x is greater or equal to pi zero plus one. Okay. And we can make this, you know, this is sort of the, the general version of split cuts, but we can just think of it in this example. Uh, we imagine that we, we just think of the case of a variable, this first variable that's on this axis. We can easily imagine, we can say it's either less than or equal to two or bigger or equal to three. Okay, so that's what these blue lines here are highlighting is that sort of split. Okay. So I start with that feasible region, that's the whole diamond, but now I realize that no feasible solution can actually be in that split area. Okay, because it's either gotta be over on that side or on that side. So these two green triangles are two different polyhedra, because they're defined by my original polyhedron and these two different inequalities. So I have two different polyhedra. Generically, I write them as P0 and P1. And I know that every feasible solution of my original problem, so all those dots, lie in either one or the other of these two polyhedra okay, by this analysis. And so if I can find an inequality that's valid for the union of those two polyhedra, these two green ones here, and for example, that red line pointing downwards is a valid inequality, so everything that's in this green and that green is on the right side of that, that red line, then that inequality will also be valid for my set of integer points, my true set that I'm interested in. Okay. So this red uh, line defines a valid inequality for my, my mixed integer set. And so that process of de deciding on sort of this split vector and then forming this union of two polyhedra and then finding a valid inequality for that union, um, that gives us inequalities that we refer, refer to as split cuts. Okay, so that's a, it's a very general class of, of, of inequalities in, in integer programming. And so how do we find these violated split cuts? So that's kind of the, the, the notion for why they would be valid. And so the question is, how could we use them? Um, and so, if we're given a solution x hat that we'd like to try to you know, find a, a split cut that would cut off that solution, um, our, we solve what's known as a separation problem, that's our goal, is to find an inequality that cuts it off or else prove that none exists. Okay, that would be the, the nice thing. Um, and so if we s fix that split disjunction, if we fix the vector pi and pi zero, if those are known to us, then we can actually find a split cut if one exists just by solving a linear program. So it's a little bit bigger of a linear program. It's like twice the size of what we started with. But it's something that's, that's theoretically tractable. Okay. So that's, that's the nice thing about split cuts. Unfortunately, choosing the split disjunction, finding a, a good choice of pi and pi zero is hard in general. Okay. So that's the hard part about split cuts. Um, but there's, there's some, a number of heuristics that people use that actually are, many of them are quite effective for finding split cuts. And the other thing that people do is sometimes they just re restrict to very special forms of this vector pi, where it's just one variable at a time just saying it's less than or equal to some value or it's greater because of that value plus one. Okay, so when you s restrict yourself to uh, splits of just that form, we call those uh, lift and project cuts. Okay, so different types of. And so since you know, there's not so many of those, so you can just try all of them. Okay, so that's why that helps you. Yeah. 
Okay, and, and so split cuts, as I mentioned, they're sort of a very broad class of, of cuts in integer programming. Um, they're, they're closely related, actually, in some sense, equivalent to, if you've heard of Gomery mixed integer cuts or mixed integer rounding cuts, these are all sort of families of valid inequalities that are, in some sense, equivalent to each other. Okay, so just different ways of thinking about things. Okay, so that's basically uh, the review I wanted to do about, about integer programming to sort of set the stage for some of the, the other things we're going to do, start talking about how to do things in, in, in stochastic integer programming. Any questions up to that, this point? Okay, so let's start out with a little bit of review. And unfortunately, the, the introduction to stochastic programming tutorial is tomorrow, so, so I'll have to just do this review, um, of how would we solve, for example, an LP relaxation of the stochastic integer program. Okay, so the LP relaxation is just a, a standard two-stage stochastic linear program. Okay, so I just wanted you to know, review a little bit uh, the Bender's algorithm for that. Um, so, so this is our, our stochastic integer program, the LP relaxation. What I've done is I've replaced this sort of value function with this LP value function, where the key difference is, is now my second stage variables, where I had some integer restrictions, now some of them are relaxed to be continuous. And also in my first stage, where I had, had some integer restrictions, those are also continuous. Okay, so this is just a stochastic linear program now. Um, and so what I'm going to do is to get ready to present the benders or L-shaped algorithm for solving that, I'm first going to do a, a slight reformulation where I'm going to introduce variables, and I'm going to do what's known as the multi-cut implementation of this. I'm going to introduce a variable called theta s for every scenario s in my problem. And I just want theta s to be greater or equal to that value function of scenario s um, uh, where I use the LP relaxation. Okay, so I, all I've done is I've replaced the Q down here, I put in a variable theta s. Theta s is greater equal to this function. And so, of course, it'll be equal to that in optimal solution. Okay, so this is a, adding some extra variables. Um, and then what we do in Bender's decomposition of the, the L-shaped method um, is we solve a problem, which we call the master problem, where I replace those constraints. If I go back to these constraints here, I can't explicitly write those down because this is only implicitly known as the value function of a linear program. So what I do instead is I get some cuts. I replace those, those constraints with some cuts that are approximating that value function. So that's my notation for uh, these cuts. This E here is a vector of all ones. So that's just representing that I have maybe many cuts in there at this point for each scenario. Uh, so I solve a massive problem that has some subset of cuts. Again, I'm solving it as a linear program. I get a solution, call it theta hat and x hat, and I send that down to all my subproblems. Okay, so I solve all my subproblems, one for every scenario. This is where it's decomposition, because I break it down into uh, different smaller subproblems for every scenario. And when I solve those, my x hat is fixed, uh, and I get my, uh, I minimize that second stage problem, and here, uh, I'm relaxing the second stage, so it's just a linear program. And so because I've re this is just a linear program, I can do linear programming duality, very beautiful, I derive a Bender's cut. Okay, so that's the part you can go to Johannes's tutorial tomorrow to get the details of it, uh, but I'll just tell you, you can do that. Uh, and so you get that cut, you send it back up to the master problem, it looks something like this, and you repeat that process. And what's nice about um, Benders or the L-shaped method, it, it converges in finally many uh, iterations. Um, you can do, of course, this has been researched you know, over the years. There's many improvements to this. You can do uh, different stabilization techniques, like the level method or trust regions. Um, you can modify the subproblem to get you better cuts. Um, I mentioned this was a, the, the multi-cut version, where I have a variable theta s for every different scenario. You could do what's known as the single-cut version, where I have just one variable for the whole expected value, and I have to aggregate cuts. Um, so there's all kinds of different variants here, which I, I won't talk about, but um, this is just an um, uh, example. OK, so now I want to say how, see how we can sort of easily extend the Bender's algorithm um, to the case of continuous recourse. Okay? Because really what, 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 what's um, going to make things really complicated for us if we have integer variables in the second stage um, so from a theory standpoint, things are going to be reasonably easy with the case of continuous recourse variables. So here I'm in this, this, this case of continuous recourse. So now I go back to the first stage, might have some integer variables, uh, but the second stage has continuous recourse. Okay? So I don't have any integer variables in the second stage. And I do want to make a comment about this before I get too much more into this, is that this particular case, even though it's sort of theoretically easier, and we'll see why in, in a second, 
it's, I think, very important because it's often the case that the, the here and now decisions you have to make are those discrete decisions. And the sort of second stage is often operational things that often can be approximated pretty well with continuous decisions or a linear program. Um, so this, I think, is already a, a very broad, important class of, of problems, even with this, this assumption. Okay, so what's the first method we could do to solve this problem? And, and this is really easy. If you know Bender's decomposition, it's, it's exactly the same, basically. The only change is, is the master problem that I solve at each step of the algorithm, I solve it as a mixed integer program. Okay, so all I changed from, from my previous slide was, previously I had relaxed the first, uh, these decision variables to be continuous. Now I force them to be integer. Okay? So what I do is I solve that master problem. I get my theta hat x hat solution. I solve these subproblems. These subproblems are still linear programs, so I, get, I use my Bender's theory just as I did before. I get my Bender's cuts to add back up to the master problem, and I repeat that. Okay? And that will converge nicely as well. Okay? So, so the key thing is just that master problem is now a mixed integer program instead of a linear program. That's the difference. Okay? So it's, it's a lot more work to solve that master problem. Um, okay, so let's see how that works for the facility location problem. So I'm going to give you actually some data, um, and we're going to run this algorithm on that just to, to make sure we're all sort of comfortable with how that works. Um, so let's think of an example where we have just three facilities and four customers. Uh, facilities have these fixed costs, these are their capacities, and I'm just going to consider two equally likely demand scenarios, so D1 and D2, um, and we have some penalty for unmet customer demand. So the first thing we do, we don't have any Bender's cuts to start with, so I just solved my master problem. I don't even bother introducing the theta variables. I know they have to be value zero. Um, and I just have binary variables. So of course, I'm just not gonna build anything. I get the solution zero, zero, zero. Okay. So I start from that. And the other thing I didn't mention is that every time I solve that master problem, because these, bender, these constraints here are sort of only kind of lower bounding the, the true value function, I always get a lower bound when I solve that master problem. And so in this case, the lower bound I got to start out with uh, is just the value zero, because that was the, the value of that, that problem. Okay, so then what I do is I go to my subproblems. So here I have, uh, this is scenario one subproblem, this is scenario two subproblem. Um, and so they look very similar. The only difference is in scenario one, I'm using the demand of scenario one, and scenario two, I'm using demand of scenario two. Okay. Um, and so the thing that I've then done is this solution x hat I've plugged that in, that's zero, 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 that's what these guys are here. Plug that into the right-hand side of those constraints where it's supposed to show up. I solve these linear programs, and in each case, I get a Bender's cut. So the Bender's cuts in this case look like these two here. Um, and I'll add those to my master problem. The other thing that's nice about this, this, this Bender's algorithm is each step of the way, uh, I've, I've got an integer feasible first stage solution, x hat. And then I go off and I solve all these subproblems. So I actually, in doing that, I'm evaluating the true second stage cost for that solution x hat. And so I can get an upper bound. I can check to see what is the value of that, that solution. Okay. So I can evaluate that. I, I know x hats were all zeros, and so I plug that in to evaluate the fixed cost. And in each of, by solving these two subproblems, I got the value of qs of x hat. So it was 1140 in this case and 990 in that case. Each was, had probability of half. And so I get this upper bound of 1,065. Okay, so my current gap is I have a lower bound of zero and upper bound of 1,065. We have a, a, a long way to go. Um, OK, so I add these cuts to my master problem. Now I have this, this mixed integer program with the theta variables and my, my binary x variables. I solve that, and I get this solution. So x hat is now 0, 1, 1. I'm actually building some things. Um, but and as far as theta hat is concerned, there's sort of still looks like there's no second stage cost. But that's not correct, of course, because I have to add more Bender's cuts to get the second stage costs right. So I take this solution, this fixed x hat solution. Um, I put that now into my second stage subproblem. So this is scenario one, scenario two. So this is now changed. Previously it was zero, zero, zero. Now it's zero, one, one, matching my first stage solution. Each of these subproblems now gives me another Bender's cut that I can add to my, my master problem. And I get a new upper bound of 352, a big improvement over the previous iteration. I add those cuts to my master problem. Um, now I get this solution and these theta hats. My lower, the optimal value of the master problem is 255. So now my bound is between 255 and 352. So I've made uh, quite a bit of progress. And we repeat this process. 
Okay, so we do it uh, a couple more iterations. I think we can uh, skip that. And so this is sort of at the end of it, we get to this, this, this last step here. This is my current master problem. You see I've collected quite a few cuts at this point. Um, after solving this, I get this integer solution and this theta hat. And the optimal value of this is 352. And if you're paying attention, you remember that back at iteration two, I had an upper bound value of 352. And so now I have a lower bound and upper bound that are equal, and so I know I have the optimal solution. Yeah. Um, and so, in fact, if I want to do a check, I take the x hat, I plug it into my subproblems, I see if there's any violated bender's cuts, and I see there are no more violated bender's cuts. And so that's another reason I know that, that the algorithm is done. Okay. Um, okay. So, recap of this, this basic Menders algorithm. It's very simple. We, we solve this master mixed integer program. Um, then we go off and we solve each of the linear programming scenario subproblems. We get Bender's cuts. If, if we find any that are violated, we add them to the master and, and repeat. Okay, so that's, that all looks very nice. But, this sometimes works very well, but sometimes it blows up. And the reason it can blow up is that that first step, solving a mixed integer program, can become very, very hard to solve. As you add more of these cuts, it gets to be this complicated thing. Um, it gets bigger, um, and, and, the, and it can be really difficult to solve. Okay. And, and compounding this is that unlike linear programming, when, it, when I was solving a two-state stochastic linear program by Benders, every time I resolved the master problem, I warm started from the previous solution of the master problem, I just added a couple more cuts, so I have a good hot start solution to start from. In integer programming, there's almost no notion of warm starting. There are some things people try to do, but it's not very effective. Okay, so you often do a whole bunch of redundant work. You start over from scratch every time you go back to step one. Okay. So this is, can be, be limiting. Okay, so, so we'll also think of some, some alternative algorithms. Okay. Um, and so the alternative is to add Bender's cuts as needed during one branch inbound search tree. Okay. So what we're doing here is every time we, we go to step one, we, there's a new branch inbound search tree to solve that integer program, and you start over each time. Okay. What we're going to do as this alternative is we're going to add these Bender's cuts as needed throughout the branch inbound process. Okay. And we have just one search tree. Okay, okay so how does this work? Um, so the first thing we're going to do, and, and I'm going to, this is actually really, really important to do this step first, and I'll explain that later. Okay? But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just solve the linear program relaxation. So I'm going to do what I did earlier. I relax, all, make all the integer variables continuous, and I just use Bender's algorithm to solve the LP relaxation. Okay, so I get a bunch of Bender's cuts at, as part of that process. And now I'm going to put them into my formulation, and I'm going to go to my integer programming solver. I'm going to say go and start solving this problem. But then, with, once I said go, though, I'm going to have to set it up so that it, it's a branch and cut algorithm, where at each node in the search tree, I'm first going to solve the linear program relaxation. Come on in, everybody. Um, so I get uh, x hat and theta hat as my solution there. If the linear programming bound exceeds a known incumbent, um, then I'll prune, just like branch and bound in normal. But this is the part that's going to be new, okay, or at least new to people who aren't familiar with integer programming. So what can happen if is I solve this linear program realization and x hat is integer feasible. So x hat, every variable in x hat that was supposed to be the integer value, is an integer value. So in integer programming, and normally you would say, okay, I, it's done, I can prune that node, I have an integer feasible solution. Okay. But the problem is that this solution that x hat and theta hat together might not really be feasible because I don't have every Bender's cut in my master formulation. Right? I can't. It, there may be too many. Okay? I, add, I add them as part of the algorithm. Um, so what I have to do is I have to solve the scenario subproblems to see if there's any Bender's cuts that would cut that solution off. Okay? So anytime I get an integer solution, I have to kind of go off and do a check. Is it really a feasible solution? Okay? This is sort of the extra part you have to do. Um, and so if I find a violated Bender's cut, then I add that to the LP relaxation, and I resolve the LP relaxation at that node. Okay. And I repeat this as many times as I need to at that node. Okay. Finally, if I get to a point where x hat is not integer feasible, then I have the option to stop, and I can just branch um, and, and uh, create uh, new nodes. 
Uh, one thing I could still do, even if excess on integer feasible, I have, I could optionally still solve Bender subproblems and try to generate Bender's cuts with the hopes of improving the LP relaxation. But if X hat's not integer feasible, I can instead just branch. Okay, so I can do it there. Okay, and so just, you know, in case you want to implement an algorithm like this, I just give you a terminology, is that these cuts, at this point, if I'm going to add these Bender's cuts, that are actually there to define the feasible region, they're known in integer programming as lazy cuts, because it's sort of like, oh, I was too lazy to add all the constraints to my formulation right up the front, so I add them later. Um, and so they're known as lazy cuts. And so if you wanted to implement this, you'd have to do that as part of a, a cut callback routine that sort of interfaces with, with the commercial solver as it's doing its, its algorithm. And you'd have to add them as using the terminology lazy cuts so that the solver knows that it, you really need to add them. So let's see how this might work um, for this, this same example, this facility location example. And I think I'll get through this example and then we'll take our break and that'll be a good, good, good breaking point. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna solve just the LP relaxation by the Bender's algorithm. So I solved my first linear program relaxation. Again, of course, I get the solution zero, zero, zero. Um, I plug that into my scenario subproblems. I get some Bender's cuts, I get an upper bound. Uh, I iterate through this process a few times. Just a key thing to, to remember is that when I'm solving that master problem, I'm solving it as a linear program, so that's pretty efficient. Um, and so I relax those to be, be just between zero and one, and so I can get these fractional solutions. Okay. And so when I solve my Bender subproblems, I might be plugging in those fractional solutions for the values x hat. Okay. But that's just what you would do in, in regular stochastic linear program. Okay. So we go through that process, um, and um, repeat this a number of times and I get to the end of that process. Um, and so I've solved the LP relaxation and so this is my current master problem. I have maybe a bunch of Bender's cuts now from, from that process. And now at this point I've, I try to remember, oh yes, I actually want these variables to be binary. And so I'm gonna take and I'm gonna declare those to be binary variables, include all those cuts in my formulation and give that to my solver and say go, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna go through this example, first of all, assuming the solver isn't gonna add any, of, any cuts of its own in the process, okay? So it's only our Bender's cuts, will be the only cuts that are added. Um, so let's see what would happen. So the first thing the solver is going to do is it's going to relax integrality, so it, those xi variables were supposed to be zero or one, now it, it solves the LP relaxation, which is the thing you just solved outside of the solver. You get that same uh, fractional solution. And now we have to start branching, okay? We're gonna do branch and bound. So we have this fractional solution. I choose one of my variables, let's say x1, and I'm gonna branch on that. Um, and so I create now two new subproblems. I'll call them node one and node two. Um, and so on node one, I'm gonna fix x1 to be zero, and node two, I'm gonna fix x1 to be one. I solve those two linear program relaxations. I get this value over here and this value over there. And unfortunately, neither of these can be pruned. Neither of them is integer feasible. Neither of them can be pruned. I don't have actually an upper bound yet if I'm just do, doing this algorithm. So I have, I'm gonna have to subdivide both of them eventually. So let's start with uh, node two. Okay, I'll choose that one first. So node two already had x1 fixed to be one. I'm gonna further subdivide now on the variable x2. So I create two new nodes, nodes three and four, where now x2 is zero in this node three and x2 is one in node four and I get these two solutions. So I'm gonna start by looking at node four, because that's the interesting one here, is that I got an integer feasible solution. Okay, so that looks like something I'm, you know, an integer program I'd be happy with. Um, here we have to do a little bit more work though again. This integer feasible solution might not be truly feasible to my problem because I don't have all my Bender's cuts there. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take that solution, the x hat, fix it, and check to see if there's any Bender's cuts that would uh, violate, uh, the, cut off this theta hat solution. Uh, so I go off and solve those subproblems. We've seen this many times. Uh, for one of the scenarios, in this case, I get a Bender's cut that's violated. In this scenario, I don't get any violated Bender's cut. Um, so I just add that one to my master problem. Um, and I get an upper bound again, because this was an integer feasible solution, and I've evaluated its, its values. Uh, so I plug in uh, those values, and I get this upper bound of 352.5. Um, and remember, our, our optimal solution is 352, so this is really close to optimal, but not quite. Um, okay, so um, then after having added those cuts to that node, I have to resolve the node. 
Um, and, and now I get 352.5 back again, and so um, and there's no more benders cuts because, because of that. Um, and so I can prune that, that node. There were no more benders cuts. And now I have an upper bound of 352.5. I compare that to node 3's lower bound, which is bigger than that, so I can prune node 3 as well. Okay, so I've made a lot of progress here. I prune both of these nodes. Right? And I have an upper bound of 352.5. Okay, now we have to go back to this node 1 that I had left hanging there before. Um, that's where I had fixed x1 to be 0. Um, I have, it's still fractional. This variable x3 is, is fractional, so I have to subdivide that again by fixing it to be 0 or 1. Um, and so I have two new nodes with it either 0 or either 1. Um, this first node can be pruned because that bound is 507. Again, it's bigger than something I already had before, so I can immediately prune that node. Uh, the second node, though, has this value 326.3. Um, so I can't prune it, and I have to subdivide it even further. This second variable is still fractional, so I choose it. Uh, x2 is 0, or x2 should, it should be x2 is 1. Um, and so I get these two more nodes. Um, on this case, uh, the z hat is really large, so I can prune that node right away. Here I get an integer solution, and the value is 350.5. Okay. Now again, because you know, I got an integer solution, I can't just accept this value as being correct, because I don't know if it's really feasible. Um, so I have to go off and solve my Bender's subproblems again. Um, this is what they look like. I get these cuts. I add them to the master problem, and now that master problem can be pruned, and finally we're done. Okay. So that's basically um, finishes the, the branch and bound algorithm for that. Um, and so that was a, you know, kind of tedious, wasn't it? We went through a lot of linear programming solves, a lot of nodes. And if, think back to that for a second. We only had three first stage variables, right? So this didn't seem like a really compelling example for that method, right, if you're, if you're following along, right? Three first stage variables, we did like eight nodes. It doesn't look very efficient, right? And so what went wrong there is we had really bad linear program relaxations. We had just basically the vanilla LP relaxation. We didn't do anything fancy at all in this. Right? Um, and so what we're gonna need, what, what can we do to improve that? So one thing we could do, which I didn't do with that example, is well, after having solved the linear program, uh, and again, if I get a fractional solution, so I, I went off and solved all those Bender subproblems when I had an integer solution, because I had to. Otherwise, the algorithm isn't correct. But I can also go off and solve those Bender subproblems when I have a fractional solution. And I'd maybe do that because I want to, because that might improve my bound. Okay, so that's one thing we could do. Um, but the other thing that we can do, which is what I want to focus on more today, and we'll do that after the break, um, is try to use integrality to derive stronger cuts, it's cuts that aren't just implied by the LP relaxation. Okay. Um, and so we'll talk after the break two different ways to do that. One is to use cuts from the master problem, and one is to use cuts from the subproblems. Okay. So this would be a good time to take a break, and we'll come back and see that after. So half hour break. Thank you. Yeah.